I've found encouraging someone is a delicate process. First thing you have to do is listen intently. Have you ever started encouraging someone before you fully heard the problem? That um, can lead to any number of results, of which none of them are positive. You know, you haven't heard the entire problem, and the suggestion you make isn't received very well, and then you think, well, I was just trying to be nice. Well, maybe I don't even want to hear you talk about it anymore. And both of you leave um, having achieved nothing towards encouragement. You must acknowledge the reality of pain. Have you ever said, oh, it's not that bad? Um, clearly, we've said that to other people, and if you've, if you've ever heard it, it's, it's not a great thing to hear. Um, if someone, say, uh, cries wolf all the time, with a, a maybe physically, or maybe something at work, and then they actually have something that really is hard to hear what they're saying, and truly believe that they are in pain in a certain way, if you listen intently, if you truly acknowledge the reality of pain with someone, and then finally not immediately offer advice. Um, it's natural, but there are many things that are natural that aren't helpful. You have to fight what's natural. And so um, to listen, to acknowledge, and, and just, just kind of hear them and let them tell you um, is, is an important factor here. Now Paul's writing a letter to encourage this church so he's dealing with all these aspects. He's writing to a new church in Philippi, this church experiencing the great highs and lows of church life, um, multiplied by the fact that there are plenty of people there that want to not only discourage Christians, which happens today, but um, let's physically eliminate them, which isn't much of a problem for us today. And so there's any number of reasons the ones that are receiving this letter can feel greatly discouraged, isolated, and uh, without any sort of strength or guidance. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, and I say it again, rejoice. You ever around a person that is overly positive when you're not at that very moment? It can be exhausting. Um, when that person is really, really positive, and you're thinking, oh, the world's falling down on me, and this person's excited. Um, but he is saying... Uh, in, in saying rejoice, he's saying, you know, be aware of the things around you that are going pretty well. One thing can hijack your entire life, and at least that's been my experience. Every other thing's going well, but this one thing isn't. But it, it takes over and says none of the other stuff is as important as this one thing that's not going well for me. And be thankful, he says. Now, it's hard in that situation to be thankful, but the more thankful you are, the more aware there are more things to be thankful in the situation, and it starts, the tide starts to turn in the other direction. The more angry you are, um, you, you know, small things make you angry, and you get even more angry. That, <laughs> the person cuts you off in the road, and it's a good day, it's a sunny day, it's been a great day. Oh, well, people cut you off, you know, whatever. Um, if you're angry about it and you're down, that person cuts you off, I might hunt them down and cut them off. Um, I'm not afraid of that if I'm not feeling great. Um, I literally stalked a person for about 60 miles on the interstate one time. Just, just wait. I'm driving all the way to Tennessee. I got plenty of time. Um, I'm going to find a way. Um, that's just maybe a little too honest. Uh, he says, and they got in that right lane, and, and I pinned them, and it was a blessing. He says, do not be anxious. About anything, he says, but in everything, um, be joyful. Don't, don't be anxious about anything, he says. That's a hard thing to hear when you're anxious. There's plenty of things to be anxious about. Um, and I, I, I was trying to think of an illustration for this. And while I'm telling you this, um, I, I'm just going to um, retell you about the blog that I do in the middle of the week. On Wednesdays, um, there's a blog I do. Called, you don't have to remember the link because it's in the email. If you want the email, plug, just email right here. It's called the Midweek Minute. And in that, you just get a simple picture and a, a, a slice of our scripture lesson for the week and a note about it. That's just something in the middle of your week to hear a little um, encouragement. Now, um, uh, this is a sign inside Wrigley Field when we had the chance to go to Chicago that it was you know, all about a leadership seminar that happened to be a Cubs game. You know, whatever, we got to go to the Cubs game. Be alert for foul balls. 
Um, I've never had a problem with that because I went to seminary in Atlanta and we bought $5 tickets that were at the absolute, if somebody hit a ball up there, it was going to be going about five miles an hour by the time it got to us. Um, immediately, it, it, it'd be easy. Now, look at the picture. Uh, the next picture um, is where we were sitting. Um, Peter Steckety, a member of our church, actually helped me get these tickets. It's, it's kind of hard to tell, but I've never been that low before. We were about 15 rows off the field. Um, and so uh, plenty of batters had ample opportunity to hit a foul ball our way. Now, mostly I'm paying attention to a game, but a baseball game can sort of lull you to sleep and you're not paying absolute attention to the batter and that's when that foul ball is coming. Now, there's two ways to participate in this game. There's, um, okay, I'm, I'm aware that that's right there and I'm paying attention, or just absolute frozen fear that a ball could come my way and, and hit me in the head. Now, that's just a simple, silly illustration, but it's a way we live life as well. Yes, I'm aware of the pains that are coming. I, I understand that pain is part of this life. I understand that deadlines are coming. But I'm not going to be anxious about it. Um, and, you know, the dictionary will let you know that anxious, uh, you know, that, that sort of level of anxiety of anticipating the wrong thing's going to happen. Anticipating the bad thing, oh, the worst thing's possible is what's going to happen. Happens to many of us uh, maybe for one day. It can happen longer than that. For some, it's a lifestyle. Um, living in that fear of, uh, of a pain. Now, what are we anxious about? Um, a paper? Are we anxious about paying bills? Are we anxious about the care of a loved one? You know, any, any one of these things can, um, can make us feel that life, life's burden is too much um, for us to keep going. That anxiety leads to dread. In my personal case, dread leads to putting things off. Um, and when you put things off, what do you do? If you're anxious about it and you put it off, what kind of, uh, how does that play out? Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to put it off. Well, I haven't done it yet, so I'm anxious about it. Well, I'm so anxious about it, I don't even want to do it. And then it gets to a point where you feel really, really bad about it. That's about the time you want to address it, right? When you feel really, really bad about it. And then sometimes it can just be too much and you never deal with it. Now, is that the way... Um, Paul writing to this church, is that the way he would have these Christians, these brand new Christians, live their lives? Um, not in the slightest. Um, before many er enter the military, I'm, I'm thinking it's all, but it might, you know, it might not be all. You enter some sort of boot camp. And what's interesting, even while staying in the military, there are several that go into a higher level of boot camp. You know, I went to the boot camp to be able to be in this branch. You know, I'm thinking about doing this higher level thing. I've got to do a whole other boot camp. Um, given that I played pretend um, on the Ashley, I've got, you know, I've got a certain sense of this. Um, but that boot camp is about being aware of your surroundings. 